steps into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also, the Ephesian church, being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Then in chapter 3, he says that the, the purpose of, of the gospel going forward and the Gentiles and the Jews, every nation coming together was for this purpose in verse 10 of chapter 3. So that through the church, incredible verse, chapter 3, verse 10, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. When we preach through that passage, I said, so basically the church is no less than God's display of his wisdom to the angelic world. It's an incredible purpose. And then there's this magnificent conclusion at the end of chapter 3 where Paul prays, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory, where? In the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. And then in chapter four, he immediately moves into how can a community of believers live worthy of this calling that they've received, a calling that is at once individual for salvation and also corporate in its expression in the local church. So what I want us to do this morning before we read this passage is is do a bit of a heart check this morning. How are we doing at applying the doctrine of the church to our life. How are we doing? Let's ask ourselves that question. We we don't want to be those that hear the word and don't apply it. How are we doing at letting the doctrine of the local church, written in such terms in Ephesians, be something we, we hear, but we don't apply? Ephesians is, is simply not a two-chapter book. Chapters 1 and 2 about the grace of God lead into chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6 describing the lifestyle, the corporate application of God's people. We want to be responders to the word. We want to receive God's vision of the church, but then be transformed by it. The venerable English pastor John Stott warns us and instructs us in this. I think we want to receive from his wisdom. He says this, first, I am assuming that we are all committed to the church. We are not only Christian people, we are also church people. We are not only committed to Christ, we are also committed to the body of Christ. At least I hope so. I trust that none of my readers is an unchurched Christian The New Testament, listen to this sentence, the New Testament knows nothing of such a person. For the church lies at the very center of the eternal purpose of God. It is not a divine afterthought. It is not an accident of history. On the contrary, the church is God's new community for his purpose, conceived in eternity, being worked out in history, and to be perfected in a future eternity is not just to save isolated individuals and so perpetuate our loneliness, but rather to build his church. That is, to call out of the world a people for his own glory. Indeed, Christ died for us not only to redeem us from all wickedness, but also to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So the reason why we are committed to the church is that God is so committed. That passage is titled in in his book, God's Vision for the Church. So let's, let's do a heart check as a church. Let's ask ourselves, and as we look into what is really a magnificent passage this morning, describing this and yet another angle Let's ask ourselves, are we, are, are we reflecting the, the biblical categories? And, and let me say this in tandem with the wonderful word and, 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 and encouragement we heard this morning. I'm, I'm not saying this uh, as, a, as a means of, of condemning anyone. I, th- I think I'm preaching to a room full of people that are listening to a preacher and sitting in a church, uh, right? So this is not a, a, a word of, of condemnation or correction at all. It's just a, a, a 
a burden that I have that we not hear the word and not be transformed by it, that we be affected by it, that we, we change in light of God's vision for it. And, and sometimes the church is one of those doctrines that we, 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 we sort of affirm mentally without um, it dwelling up a kind of emotional passion for us, a zeal, a life-transforming effect. So I, I want us to do a heart check. I want us to ask that question. Let's, let's ask, are we being transformed? Is our lifestyle being transformed? Is our calendar being transformed? Is our passion being transformed? Is our priorities being transformed by this, this book that we're reading? Let's, let's let it be transformed by this doctrine, and let's let it be transformed as Paul continues to talk about the church in chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Let's read that together. Chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Paul says this, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This passage begins with the word rather. It's important to point back, and you can just skim over the preceding passage. Paul uses this illustration of human growth to describe the church. So in the previous passage, he says, we're not, we're not to remain as, as children. He's using this in the, in the negative sense of, of childish or a, a person that, that does not mature physically. We're not to remain in the vulnerable state of children spiritually. We're to grow up. And the point here is not that we merely grow individually, though that is a part of this. The point here is that the body, the church, become a mature body, that the church grow up. This is not merely a passage that is speaking to individual Christians. It's not less than that, but it's more. I had a friend that was somewhat technologically capable and another friend who was not technologically capable. And we were, we were had a meeting one time and the one friend stepped away from his computer, didn't lock it down, very dangerous thing to do in meetings, uh, didn't lock it down. And the technological friend uh, went to the computer and I don't know how he did this, but somehow he changed it so that one word uh, that would be typed would actually always come up with the other words. So it was like and or something. And I won't tell you what the word was, but it was, it was and. It'd be like if, if and suddenly became rooster. So we came back into the meeting, the man came back in and he, he, he was typing along and, and he's typing and all of a sudden you, you could, <laughs> we were watching him and we're seeing him, the shocked expression on his face and he's looking down at his computer and he's looking at it and he, you know, delete, delete, delete. And he keep typing, you know, he look up again, he's looking around and what has happened? <laughs> my, my computer is possessed. Every, every time I type and rooster comes up, it's the strangest thing. Finally it dawned on him. He's looking around. Okay. What did you do? What did you do? And how do I change it? This is not going to work. Well, when we read the New Testament epistles, sometimes we go through a, a similar change. It's a similar change. Sometimes we read the New Testament epistles, and we, do this, we can do this in Ephesians, and we take passages that are obviously or transparently corporate, and we individualize them. So we take the word, for example, we... And we turn it into each of us individually, each of us separately. We, we kind of do this mentally, and I think it comes natural to us because we're descendants of a John Wayne heritage, and there's an individualism that's present. Well, we, we kind of read our Bibles in that way. So let's look at this passage and see how we might do that, because it's important that we see the corporate focus of Paul here. Of course, he's not opposed to Christians growing individually. Of, of course, that's a godly, every Christian should grow individually, but that is not the emphasis here. It's not the emphasis, but I think we, we read it with those individualistic lenses on and sort of substitute words. It would be as if we read this this way. Rather, speaking the truth in love, each of us in our own way, in private, 
is to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom every individual Christian, mystically joined in the mind of God as the church, is to reflect his honor, doing their own part in their own way, on their own, for his glory, creating a unity that he and he alone sees. Now, we would never say it that blatantly, but I think we sort of read it that way. We sort of read it individualistically. Yes, I, I should grow. I should speak the truth in love. I am a part of something in the sense that I, I am my own representative and there is a host of other representatives out there. But if we, if we let the passage simply speak the way it intends to speak and we sort of go back into whatever the tools was, change word, no longer rooster, back to and, and, and if we just let it speak what it's supposed to speak, there is a corporate dimension to this, isn't there? It's just transparent if, if, we, if we take off those individualistic lenses. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we, not merely each of us, but we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom not merely all the Christians individually, but the whole body, joined and held together by every joint, so this is not a bunch of, of lemmings or, or merely um, repeated uh, the same exact parts. No, we're, we're, there's an individualism here, but it's a part of something. It's linked to something, joined together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, does what? Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You see that when we take off those individual lenses and we we just let God's word speak? The, The point here is that God intends his church to grow. That's the accent here. But by church, he doesn't mean individual Christians that taken as a whole are called the church. He means the church, which is this unified diversity. As each part does its work, the church grows. The corporate body made up of individual Christians linked, tied together in in the same intimate way that a body itself is put together, that grows. And this is not merely a a status. You notice here in this passage the emphasis on growth. You notice that passage? Look at the beginning and the end of this section. You always want to notice when a passage begins and ends. Love and growth begin and end this passage. They bracket the section. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow. And in the end, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Growth in the context of love is God's vision for his church. So the church is not either a scattered association of individuals pursuing their own ends, nor is it this this uh, sort of status that we receive and forget about, like maybe a merit badge that we have way up in the closet somewhere that, that we never think about anymore, but technically we're still a part of a, of, of a, of a group that accomplished that. And, and that's what the church is, that, yeah, it's a status that we have. I, I am a part of a church. No, the idea is this, this organic, vibrant, diverse, but unified, growing people. That's the idea that Paul has here. Spiritual growth is the norm for the healthy church. God intends the body of Christ to grow. And I, no, I don't think he's speaking at all about numerical growth here. He's not looking for size. Uh, he's primarily looking at, at spiritual growth or spiritual maturity. God intends the body of Christ to grow. So let's break down this passage and, and look at some of the details here. First of the goal of our growth is what Paul speaks to first, first, that God has this goal of a growing church. The goal of our growth, point number one. Then point number two, the cause of our growth. The goal of our growth and the cause of our growth. Let's look at the goal first. Paul says in verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Do you notice this goal is preluded by a manner of that growth? This growth happens as we speak the truth in love. The growth is the emphasis. The speaking the truth in love is the manner in which that growth occurs. 
It's not haphazard. It's, it's very specific. So Christians speaking to other Christians the truth This is not just general truth. For Paul, truth would represent the truth of God's word and the center of that word in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the grace of God saving sinners from wrath, bringing them into reconciliation with God and uniting them around the person and work of Jesus. That's what the truth is that he's talking about. It's the truth that he's been proclaiming for four chapters now. The truth must be spoken in a context of love so we are neither condescending teachers nor truthless uh, loving, hugging kind of group of people. Let's all get together. No, there's this combination of an atmosphere of love in which we speak the truth of God's word in the gospel. And that describes a group that is growing up. And the goal of that growth is to grow into the head, into Christ. So we have a manner speaking the truth in love, and we have this end that we would grow up into Christ. Let me, let me just explain this phrase, grow up into our head, into Christ. Maybe you've heard or said uh, something to a, a teenager that is, is just hitting a growth spurt, and this happens many times to boys, usually not girls, but boys. They, they, their feet grow before the rest of them grows, right? Uh, many times that happens with boys. They have these ginormous feet and still five foot eight, right? And, and, and you've often said, or I've said to people, you're going to grow into those feet someday. <laughs> one, you're gonna, one day you're going to grow into those feet. Uh, trust me, it'll happen. I know they seem abnormally large now, but one day you'll grow into them. The rest of you will, will make sense. Well, that is basically the meaning of this idea, grow into our head. This isn't growing into in the sense of becoming more Christian. Every Christian is in Christ, united. But it's, it's growing into, in the sense of the body of Christ, more accurately reflecting the measure of the one who is our head. Like we might say, you're, you're going to grow into those feet. You're going to grow into your head. Right now, there's a disparity. <laughs> the glory and majesty of the head of the church, Jesus Christ, Uh, is not reflected in the spiritual maturity and unity and power and passion of the body. Now, thankfully, Jesus is not embarrassed by us because he certainly could be. But he does this intentionally. He attaches himself to a body that needs to grow into its head. That's the idea here. It's very similar to what he said earlier, that you will attain the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He's he's working off the same imagery. You need to grow into the one who is your savior. And this is the ultimate motive for being passionate about the growth of the church. Because we want to reflect the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. I'm not preaching this passionately because I care about how big our church is or whether we're impressive compared to other churches. Who cares? The point is that each church should hunger and desire that our local body, our expression, should more and more accurately reflect the glory of the one who gave his life to save us, who is our king and our head and our ruler. We should want that to be the case. And yes, individual Christians should want to reflect the Lord Jesus. That's certainly a part of it. But that falls short of the goal here. The goal is not just that I individually reflect the Lord Jesus. It's that we live up to him as his body, that his body do honor to him who is our head. That's Paul's goal here. What's the goal of our growth? That we would accurately reflect the honor of the one who gasped out his life dying for our sins and is the risen son of God, the king, the ruler, God's chosen ambassador and agent of judgment and blessing on the earth, the one who will rule the nations, that our little church would reflect in increasing ways the glory of the one who is our head. That's what Paul's saying. Speaking the truth in love to one another, we are to grow, where are we to grow, Paul? Into the one who is our head, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would measure up to him. Of course, not in his deity. This is not a deification. It's just that in our own finite human way, we would become who he has declared us to be by his promise and who he intends us to be in reality. Ultimately, that will be finalized when he returns. 
But that should be our, our desire. Yes, I want this body to reflect its head. Growing into our head. This should be the hunger for every individual Christian that the body of Christ would reflect the glory of the head of the church, Jesus Christ. A church that is content to plateau spiritually is a church that is content for Christ to be represented by an anemic body on earth. A church that dedicates itself to spiritual growth described by speaking the truth in love to one another. It's a church concerned for the glory of Christ in display on the earth of living up to the honor of being his body. Here's what this means. A gospel-centered Christian is a church-committed Christian. A grace-magnifying Christian is a church-loving Christian. A God-centered Christian is a church-building Christian. This is the... (laughs) passion of Paul in the book of Ephesians. We have to be affected by it. We have to receive it. We have to to love it. Again, there are many faithful churches. This is not a a, a kind of a pitch for Redemption Hill in any way. Every every church and every church member should have this heart and this hunger to see their their church reflect in their own local way this, this glorious goal of progressing increasingly toward the stature of the fullness of the glory of Jesus Christ. We have to attach these things. Mark Dever wrote this wonderful book called The Church, The Gospel Made Visible. Wonderful phrase. How is the gospel uh, power revealed in the world according to God's design? How is it showcased? What evidence does God give in the world of his intention for the universe? According to Ephesians, it is the church. It's the presence of people from different backgrounds who are reconciled by a greater unity, the person of Jesus Christ. It's the ability of people who used to hate God, now loving God and loving others who also love God. There is this evidentiary display of God's gospel wisdom that comes about through the existence of the church and God's people are called to desire and delight and hunger that that display grow and increase and and be a a better display of the power and, and worthiness of the gospel. It's not about the church, but if we neglect the importance of the church, we're neglecting the the display of the gospel in the world. I'm not particularly concerned about the numerical size of our church. But I am concerned that we grow in witnessing as representatives of our Savior, that our our witness live up to the measure of the one who was sent from heaven and earth to seek and save the lost. I'm not concerned about the size of our bank account as a church. But I am concerned that we grow in laying down our treasures for the mission in keeping with the generosity of our Savior, that our giving would reflect our head. I'm not concerned with the number of our ministries, the impressiveness of our external appearance, the flashiness of our our creativity in any particular way. But I am concerned that we have Christians that love to serve one another, to sacrifice for the good of one another, so that we as a body reflect the Savior who sacrificed himself to save us. If we're going to grow up into our head, we have to reflect the one who is our head. And a witnessing, growing, giving, serving church is the only kind of church that does honor to the one who is our head. The goal of our growth must transform the priorities of our daily life. God's intention to display the glory of Jesus Christ through his church, must change our lifestyle. 
It must change our mind about what is most important. It must confront whatever vestiges of individualism have, has been allowed to remain in our, in our hearts and life, as, as, and primarily as Western people. We, we have this individualism. Now, I'm not saying that we're just clones, that the body of Christ is just a bunch of clones that just do the same task. No, there's a, a more of a symphonic view. We all have a different part to play, but, but we play it together. No, we don't merely have violinists in a different part of the city and cellists in one part of the city and a drummer in this part of the city and over here the brass uh, sometimes gets together. No, 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 no. No, the church must play together. They work together. Yes, they grow individually, but they grow individually so that they can play together for the glory of God. We must receive this goal as being directed to us. It's directed to you. It's directed to me. This is the word of God to you. It must change our minds. It must transform our priorities. It must determine decisions that we make so that we are those who hear the word of God and do it like those whose house is built on a rock and not those who hear the word of God and don't do it like those whose house is built on the sand. Let us receive the word of God that the church is to be the display of the power and glory of the gospel and to live up to the person and work of Jesus Christ, our head. Let us receive that word and do it. Let's do it this week and this month and this summer and the next time somebody needs the truth spoken in love. Let's do it so that we can honor this word that has been given to us. The goal of our growth. Secondly, the cause of our growth. Paul doesn't just speak goal or manner. He also speaks cause. Notice verse 16, from whom, from whom, that whom is referencing Christ, from Christ, you might say, from Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, a little bit of grammar work here. So when I was a kid, my mom would do these grammar exercises. We need one of those because this is one of those sentences where Paul just interrupts it. You can't break this down subject and verb, but you need to to get the point. All right, here's the point. Verse 16 begins, from Christ. So everything that follows is built on Christ as the source. He is the source of the whole project. He is the source and the resource. Everything that takes place takes place from him, from Christ, but he is not the subject of this next sentence. Everything comes from him, and we've just learned everything goes towards him, but he is not the subject. Very important to notice this. From Christ, all that's to happen happens from Christ. Listen to this, though. The whole body, now stop. Paul goes on a lengthy tirade to describe what the body is. All right? Joined and held together. Every joint with which each part makes it. Okay, let's just chop all of that out. That's Paul describing the body. Let's just work subject and verb, okay? From Christ, that's the source. The whole body, now jump ahead, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What's the sentence when we really break it down? From Christ, source, the body, subject, makes the body grow. And just to make sure we got it, so that it builds itself up in love. What's the cause of our growth? Not a question you can easily answer. Christ is the source of our growth. He is sovereign over the growth of our church, but the way the church grows is accomplished through the church. This means that the church is not passive in growth. We don't close our eyes, plug in, and are just changed passively. Neither does this mean that individual Christians grow exclusively by their own individual exertions. Again, take off those individual lenses. They darken and distort the meaning of the passage. What 
makes the body grow? Each individual Christian growing individualistically. No! The body makes what grow? The body grow. Paul is unflinchingly corporate in this passage. The body, and let me describe that body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body go. So God in Jesus Christ is the source of our growth. He gets the glory for it all, any strength of growth. We've already described in this chapter four, all the gifts come from him. We're gifted by him to serve. He gives leaders to equip and serve. I mean, he just poured out this generosity. He's the source of all the growth. His is the bank account. He pours it all out in us. However, however, The body makes the body grow. What is this body? Paul wants to make it very clear why he's using this metaphor. And so he he draws it out. He explains it. Well, it's, it's joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Joints of supply was a phrase that old pastors used to use. The idea here is that every Christian is a part in a body that serves and provides the resources that Christ has given to other parts in the body. Every Christian has a part to play, both to receive and to give. That's why the body image is used. You you give, you're not all exactly the same. Again, not clones here, but there's a, a giving and receiving. You're joined, you're held together. Those are passive words. That means God does this and jo- God brings you together. God builds it in precisely the right way. God crafts this body with every joint with which it is provided or receives provision when each part is working properly so that, in other words, the, the, the body is at the same time dependent on each part to work properly, and simultaneously each part is dependent on the entire body to work properly. What's the cause of our growth? It's the church body, and our, I don't mean our as in individuals. I mean the body of Christ. How does it grow? It grows, and here's the individual part, as each individual does his unique part in the church, giving and receiving, that's how the church grows. It causes itself to grow by utilizing the gifts and the power that the Lord Jesus has given to it, giving and receiving to one another, described earlier as speaking the truth in love, as the overarching calling. And it it builds itself up as individual members do this work. And you can see why the body is such a brilliant example. So each each ligament, and I think the accent here is on even the smallest part, every joint, it says, has a part to play so that the body reflects the fullness of Christ. Again, the cause is that it would would come up to this goal. This should motivate every Christian to be the part that Paul describes here as supplying the means God has given so that the body grows. I said this last week, let me say it again. This makes every conversation with every other Christian a much bigger deal. A much bigger deal because it all relates to the body of Christ showcasing who its head is. This makes your conversation with that member of your small group, asking them about their week and reminding them of God's grace in their life to overcome this particular tendency and encouraging them with God's word, a much bigger deal. It makes the text that you send on that person's depressed day to encourage them in the gospel, a much bigger deal. It makes your meal that you provide to the person who just had a baby and is feeling needy, uh, a much bigger deal. What are you doing? You're, You're helping the body, and it's only as Christians help the body, help one another, and receive from the body that the body of Christ grows to be what God has called it to be. Makes it a much bigger deal. This isn't just doing our Christian duty. As individuals, we serve other Christians. Check. Read the Bible. 
serve sometimes, check, check, check. Individual responsibilities. No, in, in God's view, he's looking at a body. And he doesn't do occasional well checks. He does perpetual well checks. He's watching. Wow, that, that part is not functioning. That's going to cause trouble over here. And that's going to cause trouble over here. And that over there is going to cause trouble over... It's connected. It's all connected in God's mind. God doesn't build in superfluous parts. The point here is that every part is giving life to every other part. And the atmosphere in which they do this is love. Once again, reflecting the Savior who in love gave himself to die and save sinners. This takes place not merely through a few specially chosen persons, but as each part fulfills the part God has graced him or her to play, as even the smallest part makes contact with another part of the body, as in the human body, the joints and ligaments bring life and health and function to one another. The breakdown of even the smallest part, and the older you get, the more you know this is true. The breakdown of even the smallest part doesn't just cause distress to that part. It's not like you can localize pain. Wouldn't that be nice? If you just localize pain. Well, my foot hurts, but I don't notice it at all because it's just my foot. Well, well, no, it's your foot, so it hurts you. It hurts you, right? Or your back hurts. It's not like, well, I, I, have, I have this percentage of pain, but I'm isolating it. No, no, it's a body. It's a unity. They're not all the same, but there's a unity here. All contribute, all play a part in this development towards reaching the stature of the fullness, growing into our head. I am passionate about this because I think this is one of the categories where the narrative of the world is opposed. It is antagonistic to the authority of God's word. You tell me if you agree. I, I think that the mantra related to religion is religion is private. You tell me if you agree. I, I think that's true. Religion is private. If you want to help other people out of your private religion, that's your own business. That might work for you. If it doesn't work for you, that's fine. But it, it's a private affair. Not so according to Ephesians. And if God's word is to be our authority, which it is, we must be those who conform to it rather than to the satanic contradiction to the Bible that is present in subtle and overt ways in every culture. And frankly, I think other cultures than ours get this a lot better. Other cultures get community and mutual dependence a lot better than our culture. So we have to be sensitive and aware. We have things to learn from the wider, the universal body of Christ in this. No, it isn't individualistic, soloistic. No, it's not. It is a body. It is a community. It is joints of supply, giving and receiving. And that, according to God, displays his glory. Imagine if, if a person walked into a science fair with an eighth grade scientist, and that scientist had built this fabulous experiment. A, a young genius is on display. And, and, and you came up to that person and said, I don't think that's the best way for you to really, um, I, I don't really want to do that or, or watch this, because I'd rather you display it a different way. That's what it's like when people come to God's word and say, you know, I would prefer that, that we would have had the display of the gospel primarily in individualistic ways. No, God gets to decide, and there's a glory and a majesty in his decision to display the gospel corporately. What does this mean for us? It means if we love the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we 
do. And we are about that and want to display what it has done to save sinners from the wrath of God and reconcile them through the Lord Jesus Christ and giving them grace and a future and a hope. And we want to showcase that. Then we ask God, how can we showcase that? By building the body of that Savior. What does this mean about how we define the church? It means the church is not a drive through for solo Christians. Went to a drive through yesterday. We were on the road, went to a, or went to a store that had a drive through. It, it, it's, it's not a drive through for solo Christians. I'm on my journey and I drive through. I pick up some stuff and it's useful because I'm on my journey. Thank you. And then we keep rolling. And I might find a different drive through That is not the picture that Paul is giving here. It's not a drive through Useful, but temporary and uncommitted and disconnected. It's simply not a drive through let's, let's make this application very specific. If we're tempted to think of church as a drive through well, you, you get stuff from it in various ways, but you're on your own individual journey. That's just not the image we're given here. It's not a drive through for solo Christians. It's not a salad bar for hungry Christians. I think this is a very prevalent, you know, suburbia Christianity, very prevalent. It's not a salad bar. Here's what I mean by that. A salad bar... You, you sort of come and you look and you think, oh, this is, I mean, this is great. I, this is really nice looking feature right here. I'm going to take some of this. And over here, this is an excellent feature over here. I'm going to take some of this. And this is a fantastic ple- something. And I'm going to take some of this. And, and it's like a salad bar. Now, I, I agree there's a host of, of magnificent resources in the church and, and various preachers that are, we can certainly receive from. I'm not disparaging that at all. Or that, that we can receive from different churches as God moves us or as we plant it. Obviously, I'm in a different church than I was at one point. We planted this church. And there could be reasons to be in different churches. And, but if our, if our fundamental view of the Christian life is we're living with God and, and we're sort of benefiting from the resources that, that various locations or teachers or communities might have. Um, and, and this is a, a wonderful way we live. If that's the, the basic way we live, that's not really reflecting the image here. Linked to, I mean, joints fitted together. I mean, there's a reason God says this. They're, they're joined there, there's a there's a unity, a connectedness that's that's imaged here in this in this illustration. I, I, I unfortunately I I know there there are Christians, especially because of the internet is available, and and we live in a country, thankfully, where religion is free to be practiced, and and there there can be this kind of salad bar mentality. Well, I, I, this is great, and over here is great, and this is great, and I, I talk to them sometimes, and I occasionally get get some gift from her and you know not difficult to do and again nothing wrong with receiving from the body of Christ in a general sense I'm all for that having Christian friends that are outside the church absolutely I'm just speaking to if 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 that's a, a, a part of our life that's excellent may God give us many resources in many different ways but if that's the fundamental identity of how we think about the Christian life we're not really reflecting the the metaphor that God did choose to use. The church is definitely not a movie for watching Christians. Definitely not. Have you ever seen the, the, the site Rotten Tomatoes? You know, they, do reviews of movies. I never know. I mean, movies I like, they sometimes hate and vice versa. I don't, you know, I, I kind of think Rotten Tomatoes is kind of rotten personally, but but that's their deal. It's what they do. Sometimes I think we we function with a kind of Rotten Tomatoes mentality when it comes to the church. Hmm. I give that like a two stars. 
I don't get much out of that. But I got a lot out of that. <laughs> you know, I'm not encouraging Christians that lack discernment or that aren't just, just accepting, you know, anything or that aren't pushing for God to grow the church in various ways. Or like, can we grow in this way? Absolutely. But again, if our fundamental way of processing is, I'm kind of a rotten tomatoes, <laughs> you know, individually, as I think about, I'm a, I'm a movie watching, I'm kind of assessing. So I assess a, a given meeting in the church and I, I decide, well, I don't really, oh, you know, I didn't get a lot. Part of what's wrong with that particular distorted view is that it, it's all about what I'm getting out of it, and it totally removes what I'm contributing to it. I, I've found that the more you contribute to something is the time that you get more out of it. I mean, if, if you're married, you know this to be true. The, the more you are, are giving yourself to serve, it conditions you to enjoy more when you are served. The more your sense is, the whole point of this is that I be served. It becomes more and more difficult to be served at all. That's true in the church. The question about a Sunday meeting and a small group meeting in this church and another church, any church, it should not only or exclusively or even primarily be what do I naturally, without a lot of effort, get? How can I passively get something without a lot of effort out of this? That should not be the, the point. The point should be, as I play a part, am I given the opportunity, which I am called by God to give, to contribute by speaking the truth in love? Am I, am I, do I have a way that I can fulfill my obligation as a Christian to do that? Does this give me a way to do that? And also, is there a way that I can receive the truth in love from somebody else? That, that's the question. So we, we want to assess, and let, let me encourage you. And I, I'm saying this, examining myself, and again, this is not a corrective word. This is just an encouragement to, to look ahead and to think biblically and, and to be motivated by God's truth and to love the gospel so that we apply it in our life. Let's ask ourselves, do we, are we tempted, maybe because of our background or a lack of teaching in some way, are we tempted to think of these images, a drive through for solo Christians, well, that's like the church, a salad bar for hungry Christians, a movie for watching Christians. No, no, it's not. It's not any of those things. It's not any of those things. What is it? A body. A body of Christians united to Christ and therefore to each other. A body. Wow, it's one of those words that just, you've heard it so often if you've been a Christian longer than five minutes that it, it just passes over mental ascent. Yes, that's right, we're the body of Christ. And, and the impact of that metaphor doesn't sink in. Let it sink in. If you're a Christian, you are a part of the body of Christ. Now, whether you're playing your part or not, every Christian must assess and receive appropriate conviction, celebrate where that is the case. And, and let me encourage you, I, I see this being the case all over our church. All over our church, I see parts playing their part. This person's praying for this person. This person serves with a wonderful administrative gift. And, and, and this person brings encouragement to this person in need. And this person in this small group is building up. And this other person receives from what they're saying and doing. And this person is, is studying and sharing the fruit of their study. And this person's benefiting from that. I see that happening all over the church. But, but I, don't, I don't want us to get apathetic or lazy or just assume that just because we're walking into a room on Sunday and that that's generally happening, that there isn't ways we can grow because the goal is to live up to our head. Not a drive through for solo Christians. May that idea be rejected by every person who has humbly received the book of Ephesians. Not a salad bar for hungry Christians. May that be rejected and trounced by the teaching of this book. 
Not a movie for watching Christians. How could you read chapter four of Ephesians and assume the church is a movie that we throw tomatoes at and we like it or don't like it? No, nonsense. A body for Christians united to Christ and therefore to each other. God's glory is displayed in the church, which is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. A low view of the church, a low application of the church as the growing body of Christ is a low view of God's purposes on earth. To neglect the church is to minimize the prized possession of God on earth, the platform of the truth of the gospel, the ambassador and witnesses of the crucified and risen Savior, the one who contains the Holy Spirit, the presence of God on earth. To love the church is to love what God is doing in the gospel in the world that will be displayed in the end when every person united in Christ comes together around his throne and is unified perfectly and finally reflects the glory of their head. That vision must transform our life today. Day. We must be a growing body, each part doing its work, motivated by grace and longing to display in increasing measure the honor of the one who died to save us. Thank you for the ways you already do that as a local body. And may we strive together in grace to do so more and more. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful to you for saving us and reconciling us to you and bringing us into your family, making us your body, and and for this particular church, making us a body that reflects your body. Lord, we We are so grateful, Lord, and we pray that you would cause us to delight in this purpose. To reject unbiblical individualism and to love the metaphor that you have given us and to celebrate and to throw ourselves into it for the glory of your gospel. Do this among us, I pray. Wherever there is wrong thinking about the church, Lord, purify us. We, we want to be purified. We, we, we don't assume a changeless journey towards heaven, Lord. We, we want to be transformed. And this is one part of your word that we want to transform us, Lord. Transform us, Lord Jesus. Help us to reflect your truth. We thank you. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.